Chapter One of Order Number Eleven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Order Number Eleven by Caroline Abbott Stanley. Chapter One: The Man with a Single Aim. It was a September day on the western prairies of missouri the earth had risen from a fresh bath like a strong man rejoicing to run a race there was no trace of the summer's lassitude in field or flower nor as yet a hint of failing powers in the forest beyond a young man of twenty and a girl in the exuberant beauty of form and coloring that belongs to seventeen sat together out in the summer-house and talked the fleeting hours away and how fast they went gordon was going away soon and the sun was almost down they were very commonplace things they talked about sometimes the conversation was fragmentary and disjointed it would hardly have passed for conversation at all if they had been held to the strict letter of the law for often there were long intervals in which neither cared to talk but they were never awkward pauses he was no stranger that must be entertained with ceaseless chatter sometimes the silences seemed the pleasantest part of their talk they were so instinct with communion yes a very commonplace conversation but to them sparkling and deep-toned for the colouring of seventeen and twenty was in it they were speaking now of an expected guest when is she coming he asked we don't know exactly father has gone to the office now to see if there is a letter we think she will be here to-morrow i hope she will i'm crazy to see her and then she ought to have sunday to rest it is a long journey from massachusetts to missouri and it was longer in eighteen fifty nine than it is to-day she is from boston you say from near there my i dread it as anxious as i am for her to come i'm afraid of anybody that knows so much virginia trevilian gave a shrug to the pretty dimpled shoulders rising from the baby waist of pink lawn gordon they say she can teach greek and latin just think of that a woman gordon lay smiled he had been in college three years now and he was not so much in awe of greek and latin as he had once been the girl gave a bubbling laugh that was good to hear it was so spontaneous somehow it made one think of the overflow of a nigh falling spring aunt nun says she fully expects them to get stalled coming out from the landing she says all that wisdom is enough to mire the mules he laughed with her it takes miss nanny to set things out how will she get along with a massachusetts yankee she is such a virginian oh they'll get along all right if miss abby only has some sense of humor if she hasn't she'll have a hard time aunt nun always sees the fun in things but she's good she wouldn't hurt her feelings for the world it's mother that is worrying she is so afraid miss abby won't eat hot waffles and things and the spring bubbled over again the summer house was covered with a wealth of coral honeysuckle that shut out the world and all it held a winding gravelled walk with a border of old-fashioned heart's ease led from it to the white pillared portico of the house beyond that virginia trevilian called home it was a stately structure for the western border there was a great upright whose projecting gable severe as that of a doric temple rested on columns of stuccoed masonry that gave the place a classic air and justified the direction so often given to strangers looking for it take the lexington road and keep straight on till you come to a little cult house on either side were wings which added to the breadth of the facade and gave a reassuring suggestion of housing for all guests who might choose to enter its portals through a rift in the honeysuckle gordon could see from where he sat the broad double porch running back the length of the generous l its companion was on the other side 
with a stairway in it giving access to the upper rooms of the l it was a typical southern house of the better sort and had been built on the frontier by a loyal son of the old dominion with memories of mount vernon and monticello stirring in his soul and tenderer recollections still perhaps of his own boyhood's home in old albemarle colonel trevilian had journeyed away from that old home with his flocks and his herds his men-servants and maid-servants like the patriarchs of old but he had not cut away from the ancient traditions he would build here in the wilderness a new keswick that should be to his infant son what the old keswick had been to him an ancestral home full of tender memories at once an anchor and an inspiration he laid his foundations broad and deep he built to stay the place would go down to beverly and beverly's children after him some day and it must be worthy of the trevilians most men have some ruling passion says henry van dyke this was colonel trevilians to found an honorable house in the state of his adoption to make the name of trevilian respected in jackson county as for generations it had been in albemarle to bequeath to his son and heir an estate commensurate with the position he would inherit and entitling him to a place among the landed gentry of the new commonwealth these were the hopes and aspirations welling up in his heart as he had stood twenty years before on the site of keswick with his first-born son pressed to his breast and looked out over the swelling prairies that lay serene in the consciousness of latent strength this was the thought that had dominated his life through all these years keswick as it stood in its chaste beauty was the flower of a mingled hope and steadfast purpose whose trunks had grown together and whose roots had been striking deeper year by year with some men love of the soil and the habitation they have made to grow ranks with love of human things and you go on monday the girl was saying regretfully you and brother yes on the thomas h benton down the missouri and up the ohio we separate at cincinnati you know i go from there to lexington and beverly on to virginia i know it's too bad you can't be together well we've kept together a good long time our ways will have to divide some time i suppose i can hardly remember a day that beverly and i have not seen each other damon and pythias father calls us and mother david and jonathan she says any time well jonathan have you seen david he smiled at her clever mimicry and you've been friends through it all haven't you never fall out or anything like that never we don't always think alike but i reckon it is because you are so different that you are such good friends now sally and i have fusses any time at all but then we always make up you see sally has red hair and well i reckon mine is a little tinged when it comes to fusses i really think it is he was looking quizzically at the rippling mass of dark brown on her shapely head a wave of which he lifted now with a pencil he held i think i have observed that myself he said with a slight smile when it comes to fusses go away from here gordon lay you haven't at all i am amiability itself i really don't know what we are going to do without you boys she continued seriously we shall miss you dreadfully oh farge will you he moved toward her all his flippancy gone why of course brother being in the house with me and such a tease i couldn't help missing him and i know sally will feel the same way about you he moved back sally was its orphan cousin who with her mother had lived in his father's house for years he was glad she would miss him but it was not the assurance he most desired to-day perhaps she saw something of this in his face for suddenly she exclaimed how sweet those pansies are mother calls them heart's ease i just love them the young man stepped to the border and gathered a handful i should be glad if i could gratify every unspoken wish of yours as quickly virginia he said very seriously as he gave them to her she buried her face in their cool fragrance when she looked at it the color was still in her cheek 
my deepest wish spoken or unspoken at present she said gaily ignoring his look is it to be somewhere where something is likely to happen it is all very nice for you and brother you are going off to travel and see people as well as go to college but sally and i have to stay here at home and content ourselves with the same little old schoolhouse that we've sat in all our days and there couldn't be a dear old place no doubt to those that have left it how blessings brighten as they take their flight i suppose i should feel the same way if i were just starting off to monticello or elizabeth all seminary i wish i were but mother won't hear to a boarding school well anyway this is my last year of school next year when i am eighteen i am going to richmond on a visit aha then i'll be miss trevilian having bows and a good time while you'll be plodding away in school she rose mockingly caught her pink lawn skirt daintily between her fingers and made him a low courtesy miss trevilian dr lay ah i thought you were miss trevilian now having bows and a good time oh boys don't count she said scornfully boys you've been raised with i'm talking about young gentlemen real grown-up sure enough bows very fine he was feeling unaccountably depressed there was likely to be a good deal of truth in what she was saying then he rose and shook his tall frame well i reckon i'd better be going don't hurry there's something i want to ask you he sat down i went to the grapevine tree this morning oh did you he spoke eagerly the grapevine tree had been the trysting place for the four since they were children i was going down there myself but but you concluded to take a walk down by the branch instead i saw you who was the girl with you she was watching him narrowly the slight start that he gave did not escape her notice he smiled slightly whom did it look like it looked like lois chandler but of course it wasn't the mocking eyes that looked into his had just a suspicion of anxiety in them as if she wanted confirmation of her statement that it couldn't be why of course because because is there really any reason why if i or beverly or any of the boys wanted to tell lois chandler good-bye we shouldn't do it virginia's head was up and her hair taking the dangerous tinge none in the world that i know if you wanted to was it lois i don't see why there should be any secret about it nor i well then tell me he was silent a moment if there is any secret virginia mind i don't say there is it is not mine to give away that's all oh you think she wouldn't want it known well perhaps she wouldn't virginia was very much vexed she had started to find out all about this thing and she had been quietly and deeply foiled and miss virginia trevilian was not accustomed to defeat they sat in silence a few moments virginia pulling the hearts relentlessly out of the pansies she loved so then he spoke quite naturally as though the last subject had been finished up and it was time to introduce another virginia father was telling us a strange story yesterday would you like to hear it i don't care it was spoken very indifferently he looked up not at her face but her head Burge, do you know i think your hair is a little red she broke into a laugh at that ashamed of her temper nonsense there's nothing the matter with my hair this time i'm sure i don't care whom you go walking with what's your story gordon felt better it was not his intention to tell her anything more about this matter than she already knew but he would be sorry to have anything come between them just as he was going away he settled himself to tell the story well father was called over to kansas yesterday to lawrence in consultation 
just as he was starting home he noticed that there was some excitement down the street a little way and he rode over to see what it was there was a dead man lying on the ground and a crowd around him father says he never saw men laboring under such excitement one man turned around to him his teeth chattering and his face as white as a sheet and said another he says they all looked as if they had seen a ghost what was the matter with them virginia asked her vexation all forgotten in her interest they surely ought to be used to seeing dead men in kansas by this time it wasn't simply his being dead it was the way he was killed father got down and examined him closely there was a round bullet hole in the middle of the forehead well what was there strange in that the strange part is to come they say that every little while a man is picked up around there killed in that same way this is the fifteenth they told father mercy gordon you scare me to death isn't that frightful father says people are perfectly desperate over it nobody can tell who the next one will be and nobody knows what to protect himself against that's the worst of it haven't they any clue to who does it not the slightest when they find the man he is always dead and dead men tell no tales you know but every few months there is a new victim and always in the same way they sat in dismayed contemplation of it well said a gay voice in the doorway you look very solemn collie what's the matter hello sally where did you come from oh from going to and fro in the earth like satan and from walking up and down in it or rather riding if you want the exact truth where is brother here spoke a voice over sally's shoulder as a handsome curly head and a pair of broad shoulders were thrust into view who's calling the roll miss abby ann Cheever. the sepulchral tongue with its strong nasal twang came from between virginia's red lips and she lifted a frowning brow to him don't let me hear you say call it again remember your g's that's what aunt nan says she will say to me oh dear i suppose our incarceration begins monday groaned sally yes if the incarcerator doesn't strike a sandbar we are all anxiety about that now liz is in a great state of excitement because mother says she can wait on miss abby i suppose i'll have to wait on myself or fall back on mammy liz has about drained me of ribbons and belts and so forth and i suppose she thinks a lady from boston will be fat game after a little more jesting about miss abby gordon asked really what have you two been up to it was sally that answered beverly has been making himself popular with the old ladies in the neighborhood by going around telling them good-bye just what you ought to have been doing mr gordon lay instead of wasting your time in the trevilian summer-house and that was just the difference between the two beverly remembered everybody while gordon thought only of virginia and what were you doing while brother was so virtuous asked virginia chaperoning beverly i couldn't risk him alone with all those designing mamas of course not so i sacrificed myself for his good but what were y'all so sober about she persisted dropping into the seat opposite them and making room for beverly at her side i want to know virginia says she saw me out walking this morning down by the branch and she was trying to get me to tell who it was with me said gordon looking straight at beverly not sally bev would you tell if virginia had been on guard she might have seen a questioning look and a swift answering frown pass between them no said beverly carelessly girls have too much curiosity that wasn't it at all cried virginia indignantly i'm sure i don't care who gordon walks with he was telling me about the man dr lane saw in lawrence and ugh wasn't that horrible interrupted sally i've been feeling my forehead every fifteen minutes since to see if i had been hit unbeknownst to me as old aunt dicey says but it seems that this is for men only 
what do you make of it gordon asked beverly sally has just been telling me about it gordon shook his head with a gesture of giving it up i hardly know it seems to me it must be the work of one man not many could aim like that and hit the mark every time but what the motive can don't let's talk any more about it cried virginia impetuously i'm ready to jump out of my skin now i know i will dream of it to-night sally have you seen the schoolhouse since it was fixed up let's go and take a look at it the girls started together and the two young men followed discussing the case as they went they were strikingly alike in height and build a fact that virginia looking back to make some remark noticed for the first time with a start then sally cried oh there is your father now see he's waving the letter and the schoolhouse idea was abandoned they all gathered on the porch to wait for him mrs trevilian and miss nanny coming out too and even mammy hovering in the background to be the first to spread the news colonel trevilian threw the bridle to jake and came up the walk bordered with flowers how are you gordon howdy sally as blooming as ever i see well my dear turning to his wife she'll be here to-morrow that evening as beverly trevilian started from the dining-room where he had been doing justice to prairie chicken and hot waffles virginia looked at the hat he had taken up it was a black and white straw just like gordon's brother where were you this morning out hunting aren't you eating the fruit of my labors now oh it was gordon after all then End of chapter one. Chapter two of Order Number Eleven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Order Number Eleven by Caroline Abbott Stanley. Chapter two. Miss Abby Ann arrives. At the close of the Keswick School, the June before, it had been decided that they must have a better teacher than they had heretofore had, or else send their daughters away as they had sent their sons. Colonel Trevilian advocated securing one from the North. "'Will you board her?' asked Mr. Swamscott. They all wanted the teacher, but none of them cared to introduce a new and doubtful element into their homes. "'Yes, sir, I'll board her.' said the colonel stoutly my servants are beyond tampering with the whole matter had been put into his hands and negotiations were entered upon at once with the prominent educator of the state by which a competent lady was to be chosen for the position that lady was miss abby ann cheever of massachusetts who came with unquestionable recommendations as to character and attainments they had the vaguest ideas about her on grand prairie having seen but few northern people in the course of their lives and being accustomed to look a little askance at a massachusetts yankee as a possible even probable abolitionist uncle tom's cabin was fresh in the minds of the south then though with most of them it must be admitted it was hearsay knowledge do you suppose i will have to keep cold like bread for her all the time asked mrs trevilian of miss nanny no of course she won't she'll take to hot bread like a duck to water if she doesn't have to cook it they say the yankees all do i hope so sighed mrs trevilian it would be a heap of trouble to have to keep in cold light bread i only hope she is ladylike miss nanny said somehow i always think of these northern teachers that go about the country as having short hair and bad manners why so do i marveled her sister-in-law i wonder why in far-off massachusetts miss abby ann cheever was pondering the new relation with quite as much concern she and her family with her felt that she was almost taking her life in her hands to go among the border ruffians but her younger brother dr abia cheever had been one of the first of the faithful to speed to kansas when the race for occupancy began and if things got too hot in missouri she could go to him in lawrence it was decided perhaps it might not be dangerous after all but then you never could tell what these slaveholders would do they were like the human heart 
deceitful above all things and desperately wicked said her maiden aunt miss tabitha cheever it will give you an opportunity my daughter to do something for those poor suffering people the slaves said her father impressively i want you should make use of every occasion that presents itself for instilling truth into their darkened minds be instant in season and out of season an admonition that miss abby ann cheever really did not need being like her father a strong partisan and a trifle too much inclined by temperament to lay stress upon the last clause of st paul's command if you were only going to kansas i should feel safe about you sighed her mother but missouri the cheevers were abolitionists of the straightest sect a fact entirely unknown to colonel trevilian and the rest of her constituency or it is safe to say miss abby ann would never have been invited to undertake the training of their children well kansas is not far away said miss abby soothingly there is not even a river to separate it from jackson county alas alas a trivial fact apparently but one fraught with mighty consequences to that doomed region a few years later the weather was not propitious for pleasant impressions the day miss abby ann cheever reached her destination there had been a downfall of rain for a day and night everybody knows what that does to western missouri roads the black mud looked bottomless miss abby's depression matched it as from the guards of the thomas h benton the same that was to carry the boys away she watched the mule teams with their loaded freight wagons struggle through it if there had been a waiting pullman bound for boston it is possible that the grand prairie school might have been minus a head that day and thereafter but a journey from massachusetts to missouri in the fifties was a thing not to be entered upon lightly or unadvisedly and having been made the return trip was seldom taken short of years so retreat formed no part of miss cheever's thoughts as she looked out upon the scene before her it was only a steamboat landing that she saw the town lay four miles back and keswick a great way beyond do you know how far it is from independence to colonel trevilian's place she had asked the captain when she found he knew where she was going colonel trevilian had written to him and placed miss cheever under his care from st louis to independence not having much opinion of women traveling around the country alone the captain had shown her every attention that a gentleman could but miss abby's scholarly instincts were stirred to their depths at his speech oh it's a right smart piece he answered i reckon it must be fourteen or fifteen miles maybe more she was thinking of the distance as she looked out at the landing fortunately however a toilsome road like life itself must be traversed one step at a time and most of its laws are hidden from us until we are in them then our energies are absorbed in getting out which lessens the tediousness of it incalculably miss abby kept her place as the boat puffed and churned the turbid brown waters of the missouri in its efforts to make the landing with new england preparedness she had had her effects in place an hour ago she had nothing to do but to watch the scene and look out for colonel trevilian the captain had relieved her fear that she might possibly find nobody to meet her didn't colonel trevilian say he would come he asked well ma'am he will be here if he has to swim a hoss she rested upon this assurance and looked about her with a mighty interest in addition to the natural curiosity of a newcomer about the country that is to be his home there was the intense tragic interest felt by every northern man or woman who set foot for the first time on slave soil that unwilling fascination which impels us against our will to look upon the thing that we know will haunt us forever with its horrors i am face to face with it she said to herself these are undoubtedly slaves she was looking down at the rostabouts lounging around the landing while they waited for the gangplank to be thrown out miss abby cheever had in her youth now some time past seen a picture that made an ineffaceable impression upon her 
an impression deepened by constant recurrence to the subject and much sombre thought in one deepening groove it was of a naked negro on one knee with manacled hands raised imploringly while over him stood his cruel master with upraised lash she had always thought of slaves as looking like that not that she really supposed the business or pleasure of the southern planter would be to chastise his servants from morn to till eve nor indeed that in a decent community they were kept in a state of nature as to their wearing apparel she was too bright a woman to think either one but a picture makes a lasting impression on a child a fact not unknown to the purveyors of such illustrations in the years of crude art and deep feeling preceding the civil war now as miss abby looked into the faces of the men below she did not see the sullen look the hopeless woe that ought to have been there she was distinctly relieved no disappointed it was as when one standing beside pisa's tower says with an outraged surprise it isn't right it doesn't lean enough a tall fine-looking man with iron-gray hair and a slouch hat was at the landing back a little distance was a carriage with a mule team and a colored driver a gray horse was fastened near miss abby felt instinctively that this was her company nor was she mistaken when the gangplank was thrown out the tall man boarded the boat and the captain piloted him to miss abby leaving his post to deliver his charge into the colonel's hands colonel trevilian was such a man as a woman instinctively likes and trusts he greeted her as cordially as if he had always known her apologized for the weather which he feared had given her a poor impression of the state thanked the captain for his attentions to her apparently under the impression that he had received a personal favor relieved her of the bandbox brought in her hand all the way from massachusetts and gave it to a negro man called from the wharf peremptory here boy take this to my carriage his hand instinctively seeking his pocket as the service was rendered miss abby looked around for the boy but could not see any she said good-bye to the captain and started across the plank wait miss cheever better take my arm madam said the colonel hastily it's mighty slippery he led her carefully across the gangway helped her up an embankment and brought up at the edge of a mud hole from which there seemed no escape he looked at it ruefully then if you don't object i'm an old man you know and before miss cheever knew what there was to object to he had lifted her bodily in his strong arms and set her down dry shod on the other side there really was no other way madam he said apologetically without getting your feet wet reuben back up as close as you can there you won't feel afraid of the mules miss cheever i assure you they are perfectly safe madam i believe they don't use them much in your country but a mule's foot is made for mud we would get along mighty poorly without them here he was tucking a base state shawl snugly around her there now miss cheever i will leave you in uncle reuben's care he'll take good care of you he is a careful driver uncle reuben acknowledged the introduction by taking off his hat and murmuring sovereign mistress and miss abby bowed strangely embarrassed she did not know what to call him the roads are heavy that i rode over on horseback continued the colonel but i'll be right along by you his deferential protecting manner was most grateful to miss abby cheever who had knocked around the world a good deal and been suffered on many occasions to look out for herself she could do it as well as anybody but when this kind deferential gentleman took upon himself as a matter of course the task of seeing to her comfort and helping her over mud holes she liked it we all do no matter how independent we are provided only that the hand be strong enough and gentle colonel trevilian rode along by the carriage when it was possible to do so and kept up a scattering fire of conversation gettin along all right miss cheever that's good yes madam it is four miles from the landing to independence and about fourteen from there to keswick it sounded very much to miss abby as if he said thar then a mud hole would intervene and conversation be suspended and miss abby would look shudderingly into the depths and think of the mule's foot and hope for the best 
she had never dreamed of such mud and no wonder in rock-ribbed new england she had never seen the material in quality or quantity of which it could be made she was literally in the deepest richest soil of a deep rich state the going is very bad she remarked after one such slump uncle reuben half reined up the mules ma'am i say the going is very bad he looked blank the going the roads you know oh yes m yes m the old man wore a relieved look as of one who had found his bearings yes m it is so de travellin's mons us bad mistis it gave miss abby a distinct shock to be called mistis it seemed to make her a partaker in the slaveholder's guilt her first impulse was to repudiate the title and tell him that one was his master even christ and none was his mistress or should be but uncle reuben had used the term so cheerfully and naturally with so little of self-abasement that she restrained the impulse and decided to wait a while but she felt like a coward in season and out of season her father had said and she had promised miss abby sincerely wished to enter into conversation with uncle reuben but hardly knew how to begin she was desirous of asking him immediate questions about his state of servitude and his feeling in regard to it he had probably been a slave all his life how the iron must have entered his soul he was doubtless brooding over it now in reality uncle reuben was wondering what sort of a white woman this was that was so unsociable and say nothing if it had been miss matt dawson now whom he so often brought out from independence he would have had a chance to tell her all about the family and aunt dilsey and his own rheumatism and the last big meeting and a dozen other things and she would have been interested in them all but this white woman and when an old-time darkie begins to denominate any lady of his acquaintance as a white woman it is a sure sign that her stock is depreciating but of course uncle reuben was too well trained to do more than think all this have you lived long at colonel trevilian's it seemed to her a delicate way of introducing the subject uppermost in her mind without referring directly to his bondage she could not bring herself to call him uncle which seemed to her a kind of claiming relationship for which she was unprepared and yet she did not want to call him reuben her question seemed curt and almost impolite without the softening which the name would have given uncle reuben raised his hat with a gesture that was the counterpart of colonel trevilian's all my life mistis he said with visible pride i was born in de family miss abby caught her breath she did not know whether this was supposed to be a matter for congratulation or condolence except from his pride of demeanor yassum we all done belong to de trevilians as far back as de reckoning goes he was thinking if she loves i'm anybody but nigger i'll just let her know right now she's on de wrong trail then he produced his highest trump my daddy was a old ma's body servant yassum he announced it as if it were a patent of nobility i trove mas william over to jedge carruthers to be married and den brung em back next day to de in fall yassum he waited for a moment for this to sink in i been drivin up de carriage ever since even to carryin old miss to her last home mas william say i was de one what was titled to it cause my daddy was old mas's body servant yassum miss abby felt that she was taking soundings in an unfathomable sea the sympathy she was longing to give voice to seemed strangely inconsequent as she listened to this recital of an interlacing of interests in joy and sorrow that linked black and white together she determined to defer the expression of it till a more opportune time it was hours before a turn in the road brought keswick into view and then it was miles away for one sees a great distance on the prairie uncle reuben pointed to it with his whip dar's our house he said with manifest pride yassum dat's keswick can you see de white pillars just through that dat clump o trees 
as they got nearer he called attention to the different points about the place way over dar beyond de garden is de burying ground i don't see any church commented miss abby she was looking for new england on missouri soil no dey ain't no church round dar de church is way over yonder you just can see it i want to know and uncle reuben repeated his statement don't they have the graveyard by the church no em dey all has family burying grounds round here dey ain't nobody in our but miss betty's little child and old woman judy she died de same summer dey did and miss betty say she want her laid out dar wid em of course dey's a fence betwixt them but de same willer what me and miss betty planted over de chillin shades aunt judy too i've hauled balls and balls a water full dat willer yassum i is so it was dusk when the carriage stopped in front of keswick a little negro had seen them and run down to open the big gate colonel trevilian was waiting to receive them beverly by his side a shambling negro boy had taken the bridle carelessly thrown to him and led the gray horse to the stable peeping out from behind chimneys and around rose bushes and various other points of vantage were nappy heads surmounting round shiny brown faces that appeared disappeared and reappeared with bewildering rapidity miss cheever my son beverly who was unfortunately a little too old to come under your instruction beverly give miss cheever your arm up the walk on the porch beside the white pillars were mrs trevilian miss nanny and virginia while in the open door ostentatiously holding aloft a candle to light the way stood mammy mrs trevilian took the worn traveler into her motherly arms and gave her a kiss of welcome as if she had been an old friend miss abby was so visibly surprised at this that miss nanny tempered her greeting to a handshake but virginia put up her lips as a matter of course and so miss abby was installed End of chapter two chapter three of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter three weighed in the balance and found wanting at bedtime mrs trevilian took the new teacher to her room herself turning down the bed and looking after her comfort in various ways she left liz virginia's maid to help her undress greatly to miss abby's consternation help her undress indeed she had performed that office for herself since she was four having at that tender age been crowded into the world of individual enterprise by the advent of a second sister younger than herself she would greatly have preferred liz's room to her help but the girl took her bonnet and put it on the shelf in the wardrobe quite as a matter of course folded her shawl and laid it away also and then waited for orders miss abby had none to give she wanted of all things to have her attendant go away undressing seemed to her too private and personal a matter to be entered upon before another and that other of an alien race so manifestly curious the girl made no motion to leave however and at last miss abby began to take down her hair liz seized the brush you want me to brush yo hair she asked with recollections of the sociable time that always accompanied this nightly service to her miss virginia miss abby drew back oh no she said hastily with a creepy feeling at the thought of a negro's coming near her i never let anybody touch my hair liz felt the rebuff negroes like children are quick to read mental states particularly those that are antagonistic and miss abby's feeling amounted to absolute repulsion she took herself to task for this afterward but at the time it was entirely beyond her control ef you'll set down i'll take off yo shoes liz said rather coldly clearly she would have to prompt this new england lady as to what a lady's maid might properly do 
divesting miss abby's feet of their outer coverings she found them decidedly cold and her kindly instincts were at once aroused stepping out upon the porch she returned with a noggin which she filled with hot water from a bucket on the hearth miss abby sat in bewildered wonder at what was coming a moment later liz was on her knees before her stripping off a stocking from that astounded maiden's foot what are you doing she demanded sternly she began to think the girl was half-witted i gwine to wash yo foots liz returned half indignantly she did not understand having friendly offices met this way what yo foots is cold you ain't gwine to bed wi' cold foots is you i gwine to wash em fur you certainly not said miss abby firmly withdrawing the members in dispute within the security of her dress skirts i shouldn't think of allowing such a thing liz's face darkened she took up the noggin and all the rest of the paraphernalia at the door she turned i reckon you ain't never is had any maid is you she asked it was as much as she dared say much more than she would have dared let miss betty know she had said the fatal suspicion was forming in her mind that miss abby was po white folks never said miss abby firmly and i never want to have i don't think i shall need you any more to-night liz retired with head up miss abby told mrs trevilian one day about this episode it was after she had been there long enough to feel better acquainted than she did that first night yes mrs trevilian had said quietly i knew about it liz told me she did well don't you think it was a very strange thing for her to do very well familiar from your point of view yes but not from hers on the contrary it was a very natural thing for her to do miss abby stared she did not more than half like mrs trevilian's taking it so quietly i should like to know the point of view that would make it natural she said dryly well i can easily give it to you liz has been virginia's maid from the time she was born i gave her to her then there was a little obscurity about the pronouns but not more than the facts warranted nobody could have told whether virginia was given to liz or liz to virginia she has always done for her just the things she wanted to do for you put away her things brushed her hair and bathed her feet she naturally supposed that you would want the same things done and when she found your feet cold she offered you in the kindness of her heart a hot foot bath i will grant that she was unfortunate in her wording of the offer she laughed a little at the remembrance of what was said and done but she meant it kindly but i shouldn't think of allowing anybody to do so menial a thing for me exclaimed miss abby i told her so she doesn't look upon it as menial and she didn't understand your motive in declining you only succeeded in hurting her feelings they are very much like children but they almost always mean well they are a very strange people said miss abby i don't understand them at all don't you think mrs trevilian returned gently but suggestively that until you do it might be better for you to take them just as they are they are all right when you know them and miss abby she added while we are on the subject i wish you wouldn't call them slaves in their presence we always speak of them as the servants they are slaves returned miss abby stoutly yes but there is no use keeping it constantly before them it ought to be kept before them the new england woman would not compromise and before everybody else too she wrote to her mother that night these are the most inconsistent people i ever saw they will require the most menial degrading services from the blacks and then caution others who wouldn't think of allowing such things to be done for them not to hurt their feelings but this was weeks after that first night when after liz's dismissal the harassed lady was preparing for bed she had just blown out her candle and ensconced herself in the high feather bed when there came a knock at the door who's there it's me answered liz i got to come in miss abby rose and unlocked the door there stood liz with a bundle of bedding in her arms what do you want demanded miss abby somewhat abruptly she was mystified beyond measure at the apparition miss betty she say i was to sleep in hia on the flow to sleep in my room for what reason haven't you any other place liz stared yassum 
coast i is but she low maybe you was skeery but i don't want you to stay i'm not afraid liz quietly deposited her bedclothes on the floor and began arranging her palette yassum miss betty she low maybe you'd say it wa'n't worth while but she say i was to stay apparently that settled it much against her will miss abby relocked the door and betook herself to bed it is not strange that she looked upon her protector with some shrinking the next day would be the sabbath and liz's locks were in training for the sanctuary which is to say they had just been ropped and that means that they were done up in innumerable pigtails tied with white cords strung from one to the other it formed a network which to miss abby's unaccustomed eyes was startlingly uncanny the poor lady could not quiet her soul long after liz was lost in slumber and giving unmistakable evidence of it miss abby lay with fascinated staring eyes turned toward that head the moon rose and threw wavering shadows of leafy branches across the window-panes the dogs bayed the moon and miss abby thought of bloodhounds and fugitive slaves the feather-bed grew hotter and more cavernous the atmosphere more oppressive she rose at last and stepped shudderingly past liz to the back window to raise it the soft moonlight flooded the place the smoke-house the hen-house the spring-house at all stood out black and ghostly beyond she could see the line of cabins which stood to her for so many prison-houses of despair to think that those poor things were all locked in and liz snored on miss abby cheever knelt down on the other side of the bed and invoked the protection of the almighty against foes without and fears within she felt very very far from new england she was sleeping soundly the next morning worn out with her ride and her vigil when she was awakened by a prolonged knock it fitted in so perfectly with her dream that it was repeated several times before she was brought to a realization of her surroundings who is it she called at last sitting up in bed and brushing her hair back with a confused notion of setting herself to rights she was not accustomed to having her privacy invaded in this manner tain't nobody but me said a feminine voice i come to mek yo fire then in a grumbling undertone i reckon dat triflin liz gwine to sleep till de judgment day miss abby unlocked the door and mammy appeared with a shovel of coals scuse me young mistis she remarked apologetically i want to gwine to wake you but i couldn't a get in how come you to lock yo do i always lock my door returned miss abby mammy was on her knees before the fireplace she looked around in open-mouthed astonishment you do name a god mistis what sort o outlandish place is you come from dat you gotta lock de do we all don't never lock up but this is an outside door protested miss abby it opened upon the upper porch we all don't lock none of em i don't reckon dere's a key on dis place a course de cabins just has latches but dey used to be keys to de house where did you get dis hya key it was in the door where a key ought to be said miss abby huh i dunno whar it come from i ain't hya about any keys befo in reality mrs trevilian had the day before hunted it up thinking that miss abby might feel nervous with her door unfastened the front door key was lost when miss figinia was a baby said mammy returning to the subject after the first blaze was started i always mistreated mars beverly throwed it down in de well but we ain't no for show and de do ain't been locked since no dey ain't no rogues around hya i prefer to lock my door miss abby said with dignity i don't mind getting up to let you in or i could make my fire myself if you would have some kindling always ready now kindling was an unknown quantity on that place they always used chips and a shovel full of coals and who ever heard of a lady making her own fire 
there was a slight but very expressive shrug of mammy's shoulders as she turned to the fireplace the full import of which miss abby would not have understood had she seen it there was a volume back of it liz had promptly communicated her suspicions the night before that the new teacher was po white folks and this offer to make her own fire confirmed it it was reported immediately at the cabins which was unfortunate for it placed miss abby in a very equivocal position mammy now applied herself severely to the fire and departed without further conversation she did not wish to be too familiar until this new lady's social rank had been definitely ascertained i am afraid this seems rather early to you miss cheever said mrs trevilian as she poured out the coffee a little later we are obliged to have breakfast about the usual time on sunday in order to let the servants get to church we have some distance to go do they go to the same church with you asked miss abby in much surprise yes most of them are presbyterians aunt judy was a baptist and aunt viney is now but all the others who are church members at all go with us when the church was organized years ago soon after we settled here nine of the thirteen members were from keswick mr trevilian sister nan and myself and six of the older servants she called emmeline to her with a motion of the eyebrows and said in a low tone hand miss cheever the cold light bread but miss cheever was finding hot waffles quite sufficient your pancakes are very nice she remarked affably how do you keep them so hot she had noticed before she came down the great distance between the kitchen and the house don't you find it very difficult with the kitchen so far removed not at all said mrs trevilian cheerfully there is always a little negro waiting to run right in with them but when it rains oh they turn a pan over them or if it is raining very hard they take an umbrella oh no it is not at all inconvenient have a hot one they are delicious said miss abby showing her faith by her works i never saw any before of this shape waffles do you call them emmeline's under jaw dropped and the little darky who had brought them in started on a run for the kitchen never seed any waffles befo' cried aunt viney my lord whar she raised oh whar do you come from knock a nigger down sang aunt viney's bob who chanced at that moment to be within hearing get out a uh, here you limmer satan cried aunt viney advancing threateningly upon him you let me hear you impairin mars williams's white folks and i'll lay ow bob's sentence was indeterminate dodging her uplifted arm with a dexterity born of much practice he was at the woodpile before it was concluded there he sat down to muse confusedly upon the fact that what was sauce for the goose was by no means always sauce for the goslings End of chapter three chapter four of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter four a stronghold of orthodoxy virginia you'd better go in the carriage with us said mrs trevilian as she heard her daughter ask some question about rob roy no m i don't want to i want to ride it is too muddy for you to ride said mrs trevilian firmly you would ruin your riding skirt now mother i'm going to ride with brother there was rebellion in virginia's eyes she turned to beverly for at this moment mrs trevilian stepped to the door to speak to her husband brother say something it's all right going verge but you see i'm engaged for the return trip was beverly's prudent aside well i'll come home with father father yes i know you will oh yes mother verge and i are going together it's all planned i'll look out for her skirt 
still mrs trevilian demurred she would be a great deal more comfortable inside the carriage with us no she wouldn't said miss nannie trevilian as virginia flew upstairs she was younger than her sister-in-law there are different ways of taking comfort some people take it in pairs when the carriage reached the church virginia was seated demurely up in the corner of the trevilian pew sally in the corresponding corner of the seat back of her and gordon and beverly across the partition on the men's side it just happened that they came so hickory grove church to which miss abby was that morning introduced was the counterpart of hundreds of missouri churches in the year of our lord eighteen fifty nine there was the same impersonal character to its architecture that appeared in the dwelling-houses and in the pioneer millinery where the presiding genius invested triennially or at most biennially in a block and made all bonnets after one model trimming them impartially with a bow behind three loops at the side and a bunch of flowers the headgear inside of hickory grove church however was much more varied than this for it was made up of sunbonnets of all hues and scoops with blue or green barege skirts and elaborate quillings and bows with here and there a flimsy flippant flowery creation from the town milliners the bonnets ranged all the way from the dainty white ruffled ones with pink strings and bows from under which fresh young faces peeped out to the austere row of brown ginghams that covered the heads of the mctavishes mother and daughters who all wore dresses of the same material down to the youngest a babe in arms suggesting irresistibly the purchase of an original package miss nanny trevilian's piety had been seriously called in question by some of the devout scoops of hickory grove church because she would always have the latest fashions from lexington or independence sometimes it was said even sending all the way to st louis for her summer bonnet kansas city then had so lately got over being westport landing that it could not be expected to furnish fashions for the gentry of jackson county outwardly the building was not unlike other rural churches miss abby had seen but inside there were some startling features in the first place the pulpit instead of being at the farther end of the church was placed between the two front doors and all who went in must face the whole staring congregation this was the distinguishing excellence of missouri churches in antebellum days and made it possible for curiosity to be frankly gratified without unseemly stretching of necks and turning of heads a country church is so largely a social institution that it seems greatly desirable to provide for this the trevilians were a little late that morning and the peculiar architecture of the missouri church never answered a better purpose than when they walked up the aisle there was a large attendance in spite of the roads miss abby stood the test she was well dressed and ladylike in appearance the telegraphed verdict was that she would do there was time before the service began for the newcomer to look around and make some observations on her own account the place was as bare and guiltless of adornment as a monk's cell uncarpeted uncurtained uncushioned its painted seats hard and unyielding like the faith of its worshippers the men sat on one side the women on the other and giggling whispering girls and half-grown boys flocked each by themselves somehow there always seemed to be more half-grown boys at a country church than anywhere else in the world they lounged outside till the service began the older ones ready to help from her horse every woman young or old that appeared they may have been lacking in the outward polish of conventional life those stalwart young frontiersmen but they had been trained to deferential helpfulness to women for generations before they were born not only was the church without ornament but it seemed to miss abby also without ordinary comforts mrs trevilian whose family in virginia had been mild ritualists of the low church type had scandalized the congregation when the church was built by putting in her pew a footstool and a strip of carpet 
it was thought to lean toward worldliness if indeed it was not a concession to the scarlet woman and was looked at askance at first but her example was soon followed by the well-to-do members with a startling variegated result mrs trevilian had talked about a cushion but happening to speak about it in the presence of mrs mctavish whose husband was a ruling elder and magnified his office it was brought informally before the session and frowned down mr mctavish calling attention pointedly to the woes pronounced upon those who sat at ease in zion apparently these woes did not apply to the brethren or else they were more willing to take chances for in half the pews on the male side were spittoons and in the other half there ought to have been attention was quite impartially divided between these receptacles and the heads of the sermon but it was not the position of the pulpit startling as that was nor the patent fact that she was in a community of tobacco chewers that made this church stand out in miss abby cheever's mind as belonging to a new order it was the gallery in the rear filled with dusky faces and white turbaned heads she had never seen negroes in a church before and was unprepared for their presence she had not supposed until this morning that any provision was made for the spiritual needs of the brother in black she thought she had studied all phases of this subject but somehow this had escaped her she stole surreptitious glances in that direction as they rose for prayer it stirred her with a sense of infinite pathos to see those dull patient faces as they listened to the man of god and to hear their voices mingle with those of their masters in singing his praise she compared them in her mind to the captives of babylon and wondered with a flood of pity how they could sing the lord's songs in a strange land she had forgotten that this to them as to their masters was home miss abby was destined to a still greater surprise soon after the trevilian party was seated an aged negro whose white wool formed a most striking contrast to his black skin came in at the front door and sat down in a split-bottomed chair just below the high pulpit she had noticed that the others ascended to the gallery by an outside stairway the old patriarch leaned forward comfortably on his staff as though he belonged there miss abby was watching him breathlessly knowing the southern intolerance of presumption on the part of the alien race she expected nothing short of instant ejectment nobody seemed to take any notice of him however and she turned toward mrs trevilian with a question in her eye it is captain hart's old uncle adam that lady whispered he is so deaf that he can't hear up in the gallery and mr singleton had that chair put right down under the pulpit for him he loves to come this little incident and its very simple explanation made a deep impression on miss abby she was getting together a small stock of sensations that she hardly knew how to classify they did not seem to belong in any of the prearranged cuddy holes of a somewhat immobile memory the white faces around her were less absorbing and yet they were not without a certain fascination from the fact that they were the faces of the masters of these slaves one versed in types would have seen that the bulk of them were of the sturdy scotch irish stock which had found its way hither via ulster and the deep sea which had hewed its path resistlessly through the hardships of pioneer life till it had come out at last where hewing was no longer imperative with flocks and herds and houses and lands and peace and plenty around but they were the faces of men who were ready to hew still at whatever stood in their way the men of whom theodore roosevelt said years ago in his keen analysis of the new west there was little that was soft or outwardly attractive in their character it was stern rude and hard like the lives they led but it was the character of those who were every inch men and who were americans to the heart's core among them were faces of another type those which bespoke gentle blood though not less red whose owners spoke with more cultured phrase and moved with the stately grace of gentlemen of the old school 
the term has been scoffed at and travestied and misapplied until one hesitates to use it but to those missourians whose memories go back to the old slaveholding days wherever they were spent it stands always for the central figure in the neighbourhood judge or colonel or major as the case might be whose manners were a trifle ornate perhaps whose stateliness was sometimes oppressive to a ruder presence but whose breeding never failed and he or his father almost invariably came from virginia he and such as he formed the gentry of jackson county though they never even in thought called themselves by any such vainglorious name as miss abby scanned the faces of the men who were to be her patrons for the coming year she was startled to come upon one well back against the wall that seemed to be staring straight at her it was an evil face if there is anything in physiognomy miss abby returned the gaze with one that might quell even the scotch-irish but the man's countenance did not change then she perceived that he was looking not at her but at virginia who sat beside her she gave an instinctive glance at the girl virginia was utterly unconscious of the little by-play at the moment that miss abby turned she was lifting a smiling face up to gordon who had just whispered something to her miss abby's eyes went back to the man he too had seen the radiance of virginia's upward glance his gaze shifted to gordon and a sudden look of hate leaped to his eyes miss abby felt as if she had been reading the first page of a story that might turn out badly she wondered who the man was and why he looked at virginia that way all these observations had been quietly made before the services began it was miss abby's inherited custom to pay strict attention to the minister's message it was hard to do so here she found down in the front corner of the church on the female side was a cedar bucket on a pine shelf the bucket had a coconut gourd in it to this fount of refreshment came at all times through the sermon lank mothers with crying babies and a small procession of assorted sizes at their heels the clerical incumbent of hickory grove church certainly had need of clear head and steady nerves for the competition was varied and all compelling no sooner had the sermon got well under way than the children began to stray up and down the aisles sometimes attracted by the water bucket sometimes to the nearer contemplation of companions of kindred tastes a little way off miss abby accustomed to the decorum of a new england city church found herself more absorbed in the scene around her than in the minister's points of doctrine just in front of the trevilian pew were mrs brooks and her small daughter patty flanked by a little negro girl with puffy locks who enjoyed the distinction of being in the family pew by virtue of having to tend to her miss patty apparently the tending too was not very thorough for her charge escaped her espionage and sauntered down toward the pulpit looking back roguishly at her mother who was making unavailing motions for her to return cassie was dispatched to capture her but patty with a bubbling laugh that brought a grandfatherly smile to more than one face pressed on her dusky caretaker who was only a few years older following patty seated herself on the top step leading to the pulpit and cass as was proper took the step below then this reprehensible nurse showed her miss patty the reticule of sweet cakes put in to break the fast on the way home and patty decided that the time for refreshments was now she took the bag graciously gave a cake to cass and took one herself the effect upon that congregation of youngsters was electrical with a rising as spontaneous as that which lay behind the children's crusade they started patty was soon surrounded by a throng of silent hungry satellites who put their fingers in their mouths but said never a word but patty knew reaching down she generously handed each mute suppliant a cake they dropped down below her on the steps one by one to rise again when that was gone and stand as before 
then patty began to look anxious she investigated the bags sized up her following and prudently broke the remainder of the cakes in halves a smile rippled over the feminine side of the house at this exhibition of housewifely caution there was a giggle from sally and mr singleton wondered what was going on down below he had not time to investigate however for at this moment a barefooted little urchin on the other side began to straggle near the pulpit mr singleton saw his approach with dismay while virginia and gordon exchanged amused glances it was little tommy trawls who feared neither god nor mr mctavish and least of all the kindly minister tommy mounted the steps and mr singleton involuntarily put out his hand to ward off the attack tommy seized it promptly and tugged at it to secure a hearing mither thingleton the beleaguered minister gently extricated himself from tommy's grasp and patted him on the head trying hard to hold on to the heads of his discourse he began to realize the penalties of a man's making himself too friendly in his parish but young trawls was of a persevering turn of mind he caught the tortured ecclesiastic who was rosily conscious that virginia trevilian was smothering a laugh by the coat-tail and held on till he had told his tale of woe in a shrill childish treble that reached all but the dull ears of uncle adam below mr thingleton i got a thore toe there was a moment in which even the elders lost the connection then mr trawls senior who ought to have been on duty long ago reached for the culprit and the episode was closed behind the house miss abby was not able to recall quite all the heads of the sermon when she got home but she found herself the possessor of some very new and distinct impressions for all that mrs trevilian took the opportunity after church while the horses were being hitched up to introduce her to the ladies whose children she would have in school it was the hour when the informal reception was always held as the dark-hued charioteers also took this time for a pleasant exchange of civilities and nobody in the section ever hurried the occasion was sometimes prolonged until the dark suspicion arose in the minds of the ungodly that the social features of hickory grove church rivalled in importance the spiritual there was a pleasant little coterie of kindred spirits on grand prairie at the time such as may often be found in pioneer communities where a few families constitute the brahmin class these were the ones who were gathering around miss abby now representative people of the neighborhood to the outskirts of this group came a man and woman who had watched from afar the gathering of this little company and after a few words of consultation had walked resolutely across to join it they stood at mrs trevilian's back in full sight of miss nanny and the new teacher a very casual observer could have seen that they had come for the express purpose of being presented but they were standing where mrs trevilian could not see them and miss nanny ignored their presence beyond a bow they waited a few moments listening to the lively conversation with an evident sense of being on the outside and then turned abruptly and walked off miss abby's eyes followed them the woman was saying something in a low excited tone and the man's face was black just then mr singleton was brought up and dr lay and some of the other gentlemen and she lost the disgruntled couple miss abby was not a little surprised to find cultured speech and easy manners among the ladies to whom she was introduced her mind being naturally a little prejudiced against border ruffians unconsciously she had expected to find the term more technically descriptive than it seemed to be however she met all their frank cordial advances in the same spirit so far as in her lay which it must be confessed was not very far for she was encased in the slight impervious shell of new england reserve which they tried to get through and couldn't which she tried to throw off and couldn't but they found her ladylike and that was the main thing and she found that their sentences were parsed which was what she had been uneasy about and so they got along it is perhaps too much to expect that two sections as far apart in distance and sympathy as were massachusetts and missouri in that particular decade would do more than this 
gordon said mrs trevilian as he helped her into the carriage you and sally come home with us to dinner aunt viney is preparing for eight or ten and we've nobody but mr singleton and mr whalen mrs whalen is down in lafayette thank you ma'am i believe i will there are some things i want to talk over with beverly before we go and sally is always ready a few moments later he was riding down the road very very slowly so that the riding skirt would not get splashed talking some of them over with beverly's sister on the way home the trevilians were discussing the people miss abby had met who were the lady and gentleman that came up and then went away without being introduced asked miss abby i don't know said mrs trevilian in surprise did anybody do that i didn't see them do you know who it was nan yes returned miss nanny composedly i saw them it was the tigermans why didn't you introduce them i didn't want to why nan sister betty you know the tigermans had no business popping themselves up there to be introduced they have no children old enough to go to school and they are not friends of ours they came because they saw other people doing it and they wanted to push themselves in nothing else in the world oh well that kind of people i like to be specially polite to and that kind of people i like to sit down on said miss nanny besides i don't want miss abby to take her opinion of the neighborhood from the tigermans they don't belong here anyway it seemed rather strange to the new england teacher that everybody called her miss abby it seemed to be the way of the country but nan they will be sure to take offence of course said miss nanny without much concern of soul the tigermans always take offence they are that kind of people End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Order Number 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Order Number 11 by Caroline Abbott Stanley. Chapter 5 In the Schoolhouse when they sat down to the table miss abby gave an inward gasp at its prodigality there was a turkey at one end a baked ham of the vintage of three years ago at the other a pair of ducks under blankets of flaky pie crust midway of the table before beverly and to balance it a chicken pie it seemed to her like a veritable slaughter of the innocents and as to the concomitants miss abby counted up to nine different vegetables and then stopped why there was enough on that table to last an economical family for weeks while she was making this swift mental inventory colonel trevilian and beverly had fallen upon the fowls with deft hands pink slices were issuing from under mrs trevilian's sharp knife and the girls were rallying mr singleton on his encounter with tommy trawls i really thought for a while that tommy was coming out ahead mr singleton laughed virginia oh he did he did undoubtedly i am very sure none of you youngsters remember any of my points as well as you remember his tommy certainly has one qualification of a pulpit orator he makes himself understood yes he doesn't lack clearness or force said mrs trevilian nor pertinacity in holding to his point of view added gordon and he carries his audience with him beverly put in cutting carefully into the blanket quite true beverly quite true i feel very certain that nobody in that church followed me while tommy was in competition but old uncle adam i know i didn't follow myself my memory slipped a cog just as tommy announced his complaint and you were out of church five minutes too soon in consequence i'll get that five minutes back on you some day beverly the table grew hilarious at the remembrance of the scene and the jests flew thick and fast sunday as it was when they had laughed themselves out and had settled down to the discussion of prospective patrons and pupils miss abby asked who was the sweet-looking girl that sat in front of you miss trevilian the one with the very fair complexion and golden hair i think i noticed that she went out with an elderly man she looks as if she might be one that would belong to me when school begins it was lois chandler and her father she is a pretty girl it seems to me she gets prettier all the time i could hardly keep my eyes off her to-day 
mr singleton after all there is nothing in the world so beautiful as fresh blooming young girls is there nothing in the world miss nanny he said with a significant glance that took in the auburn head and the dark one opposite he had long been shepherd of this flock and sobered suddenly sometimes nothing so pathetic they know so little of what is before them so little of the pitfalls for unwary feet there is something about lois chandler's position among us that appeals to me what mr singleton asked virginia in surprise well my child he stirred his coffee in a contemplative mood as if he saw the blonde-haired girl and her past and future in its depths principally the thing that can never come to you and sally her isolation and the lonely way in which she has been raised it is not a good thing mrs trevilian forgetting that he was addressing his remarks to virginia for a young girl to be raised by a man and especially an old man and more especially an old crank said miss nanny in a swift aside to beverly who sat next to her but beverly's eyes were on his father who had spoken before mrs trevilian could reply i will answer that mr singleton he said with kindling eyes one who has been reared without the counsels of a mother such as sally and virginia have has miss god's best gift to a child mrs trevilian's color rose and she acknowledged the compliment by a deprecatory smile lois is to be pitied she said softly in that she is motherless and she seems to be a sweet simple-hearted child beverly and gordon were both looking straight into their plates virginia looked to see and so did sally mr singleton did you ever hear of our first acquaintance with old man chandler asked miss nanny the conversation seemed to be taking rather a sentimental turn get brother william to tell you about it it's no story of mine declared the colonel i never have seen any special joke in it brother william that is because it is on you people never can see a point that is coming straight toward them as well as when they are a little at one side in other words when it is going toward somebody else what is it miss nanny inquired mr whalen well then when the chandlers first came here they settled on a poor little place down on the creek and they had no orchard we had plenty of fruit that fall so brother william said that he thought he would send them over a few barrels of genitons but before he got at it here came the chandler boy one day with a meal sack and fifteen cents to buy a peck of apples a peck i want you to understand mr singleton of course brother william filled up the bag and told the boy to tell his father he never sold fruit to a neighbor but to send over and get all he wanted well in about fifteen minutes here came the boy back with the apples and the message rather stiffly delivered that mr chandler never begged fruit or anything else and that was the beginning of the intimacy between the two families in the laugh that followed beverly took part with the rest but it was in a perfunctory sort of way he had often heard this story and joined in harmless mirth at the old man's expense but to-day for some reason it rasped his nerves to have old man chandler's penuriousness impaled upon the point of miss nanny's sarcasm and held up to ridicule it was a pitiful thing for a girl to have been so reared as mr singleton had said he felt his heart warm to the minister if lois could only have had such influences around her as sally and virginia had had he never had realized before how much that all was to a girl she might be beverly i have asked you a question three times and you haven't heard a word i've said i beg your pardon sally i'm getting very deaf in that ear ask me once more and i'll turn the other and sally had no further cause to complain and what was there wrong about his wanting to buy the peck of apples asked miss abby leaning past the two and speaking with a puzzled air it seemed to her that she had missed the point oh nothing returned miss nanny nothing at all only men in this part of the country don't buy apples that way and don't sell them at all unless they have a wagon load or so i want to know said miss abby and simultaneously four pairs of young eyes sought the turkey on their plates he's peculiar said colonel trevilian he hasn't a particle of tact 
you remember mr whalen his taking mr pasco to task about leaving his machinery out in the field told him to his face that it was shiftless shiftless in the extreme was the way he put it you know pasco prides himself on his farming that was rather amusing replied mr whalen with a chuckle especially considering the two farmers colonel yes sir yes and they laughed heartily they did not explain the difference but miss abby rightly conjectured that one was successful and the other was not when there was a moment of silence she broke it by asking with pedagogic directness and don't you think it is shiftless to leave machinery out they found later that she never failed to have a question or a remark to drop into the conversation when it began to bubble they were always eminently practical and to the point but they never failed to precipitate the solution after dinner the young people went out to the schoolhouse which had been treated to a fresh coat of whitewash and a new blackboard in honour of miss abby sally opened her eyes at seeing on the table the hour-glass and the big globe that had never before left colonel trevilian's office he had himself transferred them to the schoolhouse with a natural desire to let the new teacher from the north see that they were quite up to date on the border in the matter of equipment they dropped into the same seats they used to occupy sally and virginia together with gordon behind them and beverly alone on the other side sally come over here i'm lonesome aha you miss the young lady with the golden hair do you yes replied beverly and in default of her i'll take the young lady with the auburn hair no don't sit in front of me sit by me it is your last chance you won't won't you he gave his desk a whirl and sally went shrieking into the aisle for the trevilian schoolhouse seats were rude wooden ones each a part of the desk behind and not screwed down the occupants were thus entirely at the mercy of their neighbors in the rear and sometimes it had proved the tender mercies of the wicked they would find themselves often in the midst of study unexpectedly swept into the aisle by impatient or mischievous hands and as in the instinctive working of that law which is said to be nature's very first they invariably clutched the desk in front as they went the hapless possessor of that in turn would be thrust into the opposite aisle so those old desks kept up a zigzag that varied the monotony of school life immensely it had been an old trick of beverly's to set that ball rolling he played the trick once too often though for miss lavinia saw him and the next day the seats were changed the boys now alternating with the girls who would presumably keep them straight this brought virginia and sally in front of gordon and beverly on the other side behind a girl with flowing yellow hair who always sat alone nobody in the back of the room seemed to mind the change and beverly least of all if miss lavinia had meant this for a punishment she had underestimated the age of her pupils beverly had never been so near the yellow-haired girl before how like a rose-leaf her cheek was and her hair was like spun gold why did the girls play with her he wondered or choose her in the spelling match what are you girls going to study asked gordon when quiet was restored and sally had capitulated by sitting beside beverly paley's natural theology alexander's evidences of christianity and somebody's mental philosophy i forget whose who there was a wailing whistle then beverly rose placed his hand on his heart and made a low bow first to one and then to the other ladies you have made a wise choice these studies will fit you most beautifully for social life in richmond and lexington where i understand you expect to shine next year but with anxious inquiry are you in doubt about christianity may i ask oh brother all the girls study evidences of christianity in their senior year and i thank you we are seniors if we don't go to college for next year we stop ah and who are the other seniors that next year are going to stop there's nobody but sally and molly driscoll and myself of the girls by the way said gordon does anybody ever see anything of rene taggart nowadays and there was a peal of laughter without apparent cause i'm like you gordon i never hear of molly driscoll without thinking of rene taggart didn't she give it to molly that day jemimy 
i bet molly never has thrown it up to another girl that she was poor white folks it served her right said gordon sternly she had no business to say it it changed that child's whole life she was a bright little thing if she was a taggart and she was trying so hard to be like the rest of you girls and make something of herself it was too bad said virginia she never has been to school a day since you made a friend that day gordon said beverly they say the taggarts never forget i'm thinking i made an enemy too gordon returned with a smile molly driscoll will hardly speak to me yet if she ever gets a chance to do me a bad turn but wasn't renee game interrupted beverly with reminiscent admiration she never shed a tear through the whole thing while molly blubbered like a baby which was all he knew about it the haw bush could have told a different tale it was a pitiful little story for all their merriment over it and is worth telling perhaps if only to show how quickly a flickering flame of aspiration can be put out then too it may have been the primal cause of something that happened one dark night on grand prairie long afterward perhaps nobody ever connected the two but the hidden springs of life sometimes lie very far from the spot where they emerge as deeds rene had been one of the few creek folks that patronized the trevilian school and she had never gone until that time four years ago the last year before the boys went away to college she had gone steadily then until molly driscoll told her one day that she was poor white folks i dare you to say that again rene had challenged with eyes flashing and fingers that tingled for the touch of hair and molly could not take a dare there was where the trouble came in it's good enough for you molly driscoll gordon lay had said indignantly when the girl who wasn't poor white folks emerged with bleeding nose and dishevelled hair and garments that told of the conflict from under the hands of the one who was you had no business to say it renee was standing motionless her nostrils dilated her breath coming hard she was watching every movement of her antagonist like a cat ready to spring i'll say it if i want to blubbered molly goaded past common prudence by gordon's scorn it's so anyway and in an instant the battle was on again they were parted at last the girls taking molly to the pump while renee with white face and blazing eyes stood facing miss lavinia it wasn't her fault miss lavinia gordon had hastened to say molly made her do it i saw the whole thing he was almost a man in size then though he was not much over sixteen and she was a child of thirteen he stooped and brushed the dust from her dress love of fair play had always been strong in gordon go to your seat irene miss lavinia had said not unkindly i will talk with you about this after school she did not have the opportunity renee walked straight into the schoolroom packed up her belongings and vaulted through the window before miss lavinia had finished hearing the story from the excited children her school days were over the girl's way home lay through the pasture back of the house which led down to the creek she looked neither to the right nor the left until she was safe behind the shelter of a clump of haw bushes then she threw herself on the ground and wept it out in an agony of humiliation and fierce grief and anger they do not know the human heart who speak lightly of childish sorrows it is true they are evanescent but for intensity of suffering and blackness of despair there is nothing in later years to approach them when time has taught us the truth we know that nothing lasts but at thirteen we are sure that we will stagger under this load for ever poor renee by the time she had reached the sobbing stage she saw that the case was quite hopeless she could never never go back the neighborhood had wondered a little when she started in the first place it was something new for a taggart to show any desire to climb anything less material at any rate than the creek banks and the walnut trees they did this fearlessly enough girl and boys alike but otherwise the ways of the taggarts were usually down the child had had one heavenly glimpse of a different life during those months at the keswick school she found herself trying to be like the rest she braided her hair as virginia did and when sally devereux came out one day in hoops renee got a grapevine and ran it in the hem of her petticoat it was rather stiff and thumped a good deal when she sat down but it was much better than no hoops she thought 
that there was a difference between her and the rest of the girls when they saw all too plainly she did not try to bridge the gulf and neither it must be confessed did they being full of themselves and the unconscious selfishness of youth there had been one day though when she had seemed just like the rest a day that stood out in her memory as the one in which for one brief space she entered paradise it was the time they were playing plate and the boys instigated by gordon had made her a bell gordon had thought it was too bad for her to be so left out and the boys took their cue from him she had never had such a heavenly time the girl sobbing under the haw bush was thinking of that day with the rest and it was all over there was a fresh burst of weeping at that and sobbing and then the dull ache about the throat that we all can remember no matter how far we have got from the haw bush but through the shame and the hurt and the despair so strange a thing is a girl's heart there had been a throbbing note of joy he stood up for me it said gordon stood up for me poor rene virginia said beverly in the first pause for they had been full of laughter and chat while we have been following rene's little story who was that fellow that stared you out of countenance in church to-day the one that sat over by the wall virginia looked annoyed i suppose you mean that horrid old emmons baird i hate that man he stares at me so that i always feel as if something was the matter with me that my hair was coming down or i had too much starch on my face or something i put my hand up a half dozen times this morning to see if my hairpins were coming out did you see anything wrong about me she demanded of gordon raising to him a face that emmons baird might well be forgiven for feasting his eyes upon no he returned gravely his lips twitching a little i didn't see anything wrong about you i don't see anything wrong now well if i were going to be here beverly said savagely i would make him understand that he had to look at old mrs mctavish next sunday or somebody else who is he anyway has he come here lately he lives down here on the old baskin place he's nothing but a renter they say he doesn't look to me as if he ever owned anything though i believe he did buy old uncle bob and aunt cindy at mr baskin's sale there are two of these bairds this emmons and another one named jim where did they come from they claim to be virginians but i don't believe they ever set foot on virginia soil myself said this loyal namesake of the old dominion this emmons baird was over here one day and aunt nan says he got awfully tangled up in the counties dreadful said beverly in mock consternation i know that finished him with aunt nan she thinks if a fellow can't tell off the counties of virginia as he would the multiplication table he has pretty nearly lost his chance of being counted with the elect well not so bad as that brother but certainly his chance of being numbered with the f f v s that was the day miss tiny and miss tony were here and miss tiny began to question him about the bairds in virginia that she had known she seemed deeply impressed when he said he belonged to that family but she lost her faith when he couldn't tell his grandmother's name she said to me privately after he was gone he may be all ripe child but i always have my doubts of a man that can't tell his great-grandmother's name before she was married i do indeed there was hilarious laughter at this for virginia had the gift of mimicry and miss tiny was a good subject how long has he been here asked gordon he too felt an interest in the man which was antagonistic they came here about a year and a half ago i have heard father say but i never saw them till last spring did you sally there seemed something mysterious about them father says they never went anywhere at all when they first came into the neighborhood not even to the store they always sent old uncle bob lately they have been coming to church and mother thinks we ought to speak to them and sort of encourage them it strikes me this one needs discouraging said gordon oh gordon not about coming to church but i'm not going to talk to him he comes over here to see father sometimes and we have to be polite to him but i don't like his looks myself neither do i said beverly rising you'd better let mother do the encouraging you study christianity and let her practice it come on folks let's all go down to the grapevine tree as they were starting virginia heard her mother calling her you all go on she said i'll be there in a minute i'll wait for you here said gordon 
when she was gone he sat staring at the blank walls which seemed blanker than ever suddenly there were no grateful green boards then for tired eyes to rest upon no bright tinted maps no pictures to relieve the staring whiteness none well perhaps we might accept the two great panels on the side framed by the window casings to which gordon turned to-day as he had so often done in the years gone by there nature hung each day a fresh canvas on it were limitless expanses of shaded greens and gorgeous western skies such as no lesser artist would dare to paint and a restless ocean whose grassy billows rose and fell with every passing breeze and took on the shifting lights and shades and shimmer of the sea there was no lack of variety in those panelled scenes either in subject or colouring sometimes as to-day it was a pastoral in green sometimes a landscape in sober browns lit up by the scarlet of the sumac and the hickory's gold some days the world was in a winding sheet of white there was so much more in the picture than met the eye gordon could see from where he sat the curling smoke of his own home over there where the woods dipped down to the creek he knew every foot of that creek bank in the spring days he and beverly virginia and sally they four and no more used to scour those woods for red buds and dogwood and service berries which they ate with endless discussions that he smiled to recall as to whether it was service or sarvis then there had been the earlier tramps which necessitated the girls wearing their gum shoes when the sap began to flow and the grapevine's blood must be caught in tin buckets to use later in the mysteries of the feminine shampoo in the fall those old grapevines enticed them again and the boys climbed to perilous heights and threw down the luscious clusters into the girls outstretched skirts and they all sought the gnarled old trunk that had served them so well and served them still with outspread seats just large enough for four there were pawpaws and blackhaws and hickory nuts in those woods and later on when the frost had laid its withering touch on all else the defiant persimmon which like some hearts needs this sharp touch to turn its acrid juices to sweet succulence and use and the vicious little winter grapes which even the frost could not more than half subdue but which were vicious to the last and puckered the mouth and made one shut his eyes and shiver and feel that he had suddenly developed mumps all these gordon saw in the picture over the rise between colonel trevilian's and dr lay's ran the road the big road it was always called it looked to-day like a tawny ribbon laid over that cloth of green sometimes it was lost for a space but it would bob up again somewhere else and the ox teams that had been lost would emerge from the sink in which they had been swallowed up the young man in the schoolhouse was under memory's spell he almost expected to see the prairie schooner with its tow-headed youngsters peering out from every opening the household gods swinging below and the sad-eyed yellow dog guarding them this had been the supreme excitement of their childish life he could see once more the rising along the line of boys and hear the thrilling whisper pass from one to another movers movers but the smile faded from his lips those old pictures had made his heart tender to-day would it ever again be just the same a vague depression that he could not throw off had fallen upon him he rose and stood by the open window drawing in a great breath would this cataclysm that his father feared for the country really come upon it they had had stirring times on the border already who was this mysterious avenger or assassin or whatever he was who had been dealing out death with such a relentless hand across the caw suppose he should come over the line he shivered all he held dear was on this border and he was leaving it then with sudden wrath he thought of the man who had dared to look at virginia with covetous eyes that day there was a step a vision in the doorway a voice and the sun shone what are you looking at gordon the shadows she stood beside him and together they looked out over the peaceful scene the shady vales the uplands basking in the sunshine the floating fleecy clouds that cast their shadows on the meadows primeval where cattle stood knee-deep in the lush grass and ate their fill shadows that shifted and darkened and melted away as they looked that dropped down here and lifted there and chased each other over the sun-kissed plain till it seemed that they were playing hide-and-seek with the very god of day 
gordon had called virginia's attention to this panorama of cloud shadows one day long years ago as they stood together at this very window after that they somehow felt that it was theirs by right of discovery they never spoke of it to anybody else they kept it to themselves one of nature's sweet secrets that she had told to them alone to-day as they stood side by side and watched it for the last time their souls were flooded with the sweet ecstasy of it all and the haunting elusive undertone of sadness that always comes with nature's masterpieces ah the beautiful play of lights and shades on virgin meadows End of chapter five